G'day nerds, um, we're going to talk about how we would evaluate a secondary source, whether it's useful or not. Uh, and hopefully this cute little guy will make some sense in a minute. Now, our learning goal here is to be able to essentially make a judgment, right? Like we want to grab a source at the end of this and be able to break it down and go, here is a series of reasons that we think this source is good. Here are some parts which are not as great about it. Um, and then make a judgment as to whether or not it's it's excellent or it's it's trash or whatever. So here's your vocabulary. If I just get you to pause the video for a second, um, write these words down and you'll have them to refer back to as we move through the lesson. So here's our little guy. What is he? Um, he is a packer, um, P-A-C-A. -A. He's a little South American rodent. He's, a, he's not too little of a rodent, but he's pretty cute. And he's gonna help us work out whether or not a secondary source is useful. So first off, we'll start with the P. That's right, it's an acronym. Um, what's the purpose? Why was this secondary source published in the first place? Then we go to A, which is authority. Who are or what are the expertise of the author or publisher for that matter? Because publisher has a lot to do with it, as in who's produced it, who's paid for it to be made. Uh, currency, and that's how current is it, how recent, so it's not money, it's how recent is the source because, you know, some ideas become outdated pretty quickly. Um, and accuracy. How correct is the information? That's really important and actually probably a bit trickier to work out than you think. And finally, we'll talk about triangulation. This is where we, um, and this is to do with accuracy mostly, this is where we can find at least two other sources that sort of are independent and back up what we're talking about. So that's our framework and we'll move forward with that. All right, so we'll start off with purpose. What is the purpose of the source? And a really common thing I'll always come back to is the the vaccination argument. Um, it's a weird argument because it shouldn't exist. Um, but anyway, it does. So there's a lot of anti-vax literature out there and pro-vax literature. Um, yeah, and as you know, we're talking about purposes, uh, stating positions. Our position, my position on this one is that obviously pro-vaccines, that's the way the world works. Uh, okay, so... What's the purpose? Is it to inform or educate? That is one potential purpose. Uh, Wikipedia, encyclopedia, newspapers, they tend to be to inform or educate, but that newspapers one, even encyclopedias actually, there's a little one, a little sort of minor gap, a, a change in there. For example, is it sales? Could this article be written to boost up sales? Um, but often, in this case, we're looking at websites selling something. Okay, so they're in they'll be set up to look like they're informing you about something, but the whole thing is to inform you about a, a substance that they sell right there. Um, advertorials, we'll see these a lot of the times in newspapers where it looks like an article, but it's actually sponsored by a certain company. It's an advertisement. Or affiliate links, you'll see people in blogs or um, other sorts of information where they'll be like, hey, we're reviewing this um, equipment here or this idea or this this topic and this book and by the way if you buy it from our link right here we'll get a few dollars and it'll all be good so that doesn't mean that they're bad sources but it it's something you need to be aware of rhetoric so is this is the purpose to support a particular controversial position or not even controversial just to support a particular position again this doesn't mean it's bad but you've got to be careful you might want to check out what its links are, what its references are. And language, is it overly emotive language or is it clinical? Is it being convincing by talking about all the way that people could die and, and blah, 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 or is it being you know straight down the line? This is this is this. Is it satire or is it intentionally misleading? The amount of times I've had an assignment um, presented to me and it's one of its main sources is The Onion, which is a website that has satirical fake news, um, is, is it's <laughs> more than it should be. So is it a satire? Is it a Poe? Poe's, uh, look that up. Um, is it a satire of the current events? Let's have a look at authority. So the author, um, who produced or paid for the source? Are uh, the credentials given, experience, education, etc. So how do we know how credible the author or the sponsor, I guess, is? Um, can you Google or contact the author? It's amazing. Like a lot of the times with flexibility, if you just contact the author, they'll be able to answer your questions. But a lot of people don't think about it when they do that for assignments. But if you do, like you just 
if you find a website or a news article, give give the author an email. See what happens. Um, who's the publisher? What can you learn about the publisher? Do they have a history? Um, are they a book publisher who's known for publishing Nazi propaganda, but here's this one thing that supports your idea? Well, maybe, you know, you want to have a think about that. Um, are they a book publisher? Like, large book publishers often require, you know, they've got a fair bit of fact-checking and stuff going on. News organizations will do the same. Small independent publications, doesn't mean they're wrong, but they're not as able to... Um, fact check as well because they don't have the resources is it an industry publication that's actually a big deal if it's an industry publication it's obviously going to be pro whatever their case is or whatever it is you're reading about um and again what else have they published is there a history it's worth checking out um are the details of the author behind a paywall this is actually you see this a lot on older pseudoscience websites so are the details of the author or is it like, here's a taste, and here's a little bit of information if you pay to become a member? Um, chances are it could lose a bit of credibility because they're not upfront with what they are. Um, they're trying to sell you something, and yeah, currency. Um, how current is the source? Um, how old is the information? Um, is it at, clearly out of date? Like, can you find more, a lot of more recent stuff which contradicts it? Um, is the new contradictory evidence available? Um, are the references out of date or old? A lot of people will throw me, like for example, I do a little bit of reading about education stuff, makes sense, and online education, uh, blended learning. And a lot of the arguments I get against me or against what we're, we're arguing for here sometimes are sources that were uh, 10 years old. Um, the technology is really different. This doesn't mean that their concerns are wrong, but it does mean that they're talking about outdated technology. Is it updated regularly? Is it an old GeoCities website from the 90s? Um, again, doesn't mean it's incorrect, but it means that maybe the information is not the most current. And do the links work? Is this a website that still is active? This is important. Um, because we use those links to check their work, to check their ideas. And the accuracy. Is it correct? So is it peer reviewed? Um, this is when we have other experts verifying the information before it's published. You see this a lot in scientific journals, um, in journals in general. Um, is there a reference list? Wikipedia, for example, has a reference list that you can check exactly. Um, is there a bias? Um, is there a bias presented? And if there is a bias presented, because that's not necessarily a bad thing, is it acknowledged? But are there, you know, political leanings, links for sale, and all that sort of stuff. So is there a bias in here which is at least acknowledged? Um, and how does the bias affect the information? Do they ignore all of the positives that you've found in other places just to make their point? So again, then we get to triangulation. Find two other independent sources that don't reference each other, so they're not like, going, this it links to this, um, and see if they can back up the idea, back up the evidence. So is it verified in other sources? Um, and they need to be independent. One thing I'd like to finish on is a logical fallacy, and that's beware the argument from authority. It's a really easy trap to fall into. Um, so all these guidelines, they help you build a case to decide if a source is reliable and accurate, but it's not absolute. There are other cases, um, other things to take into consideration, or um, some will have excellent authority, excellent currency, um, excellent uh, maybe authority, currency, um, struggle with accuracy and struggle with the purpose. Like, what's it for? It might be, you know, to push an idea. And, and yeah, it's current. And yeah, the, the people are experts in a field, but maybe they're experts in a field who are being a bit um, deceptive. So, it's a guide. Now, highly credentialed people or experts, we often treat those as though they're automatically correct. I know a lot of the times I'll say stuff in class, um, and if it feels a bit hinky to me, I'll have to go check it because the students believe it, right? Like they, they take it on. I'm the expert in the room. By the way, your teachers aren't experts. We we still make mistakes and, and it's important that you guys, you know, stay looking for it. Um, so this is a fallacy or a false assumption. Um, and it's the argument from authority. Just because someone is an expert, they can still be wrong. Or if they're an expert in one area, it doesn't mean they know everything about another area. 
So there was this extra, um, this excellent scientist, and he was good, like he was doing good work, uh, Dr. Theophilus Painter, and he discovered that humans had 24 chromosomes. Now, this was discovered really rapidly to be incorrect, but it was published in some textbooks. And because it was published in his textbooks, um, the including scientists and researchers, the people using the incorrect number of chromosomes for humans for nearly 50 years in some cases. In fact, there was an example recently where it, this popped up and he was credited in a, a textbook out of England, I think about like a year and a half ago. So it's still, this is, you know, this is still happening. So just because someone's an expert doesn't mean they are automatically correct. All right, that was a long one. Thanks for watching. Um, if you have any questions, put them in the comments below and we'll get back to you as quick as we can. Uh, yep, thanks for watching and see you next time. Bye now.